So good evening, everyone. I'm Carla Bodinghouse Umland. I'm the assistant director at Stonington Free Library. I would like to thank you all for being here today and to give special thanks to David Eichelberg and the Mohegan Tribe for presenting this program and for all the work they have put into it. Also, many thanks to the rest of our staff and volunteers for their support in organizing this event. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by the Public Library of New London, along with Bill Memorial, Mystic and Noank, Waterford Public, mm. Rotten Public, Ledger Public, and Otis Libraries. We're grateful for their collaboration. <clears throat> Excuse me. During the talk, we will keep audience microphones muted. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. And at that point, you'll be able to unmute and ask your question. We are recording the program and you'll find it, the recording on our YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. You may have seen that the Mohegan tribe has been mentioned in the news recently, since in June, chief of the Mohegan tribe, Lynn Malerba was appointed by President Biden to serve as treasurer of the United States. And we all applaud this historical and auspicious achievement. The tribe has made it very easy to learn more about Mohegan culture. The wonderful Tantaquidgen Museum, which is operated by the Mohegan tribe is located nearby in Uncasville, Connecticut and admission is free. And I've been there a couple of times and I highly recommend it. Um, Another easy way to learn more about Mohegan culture is what we're doing right here. And I was fortunate to learn about this outreach program. And as a result, I'm pleased to introduce David Eichelberg, one of the outreach and tradition specialists for the Mohegan tribe. David's job is to visit schools and other organizations to share his culture and history with those who are interested. David demonstrates pieces of Mohegan culture through song, dance, and teachings in order to help others better understand the Mohegan tribe as a people. Thank you for being with us. And I turn the microphone over to David now. All right. Hello, everyone. We woman, Wami Skitompak, Natiwis Pataka Mawasos. I wanted to introduce myself in our native language, uh, the Mohegan language. What I said was, I said, welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is David. Um, so uh, like Carla said, I'm an outreach and tradition specialist. Um, that is a wide range of duties. Uh, so not only do I get to teach uh, my local community members um, about uh, our history and culture, but also I get to teach our, uh, our own tribal members multiple pieces as well as I am the boys drum instructor, along with the boys and men's dance teacher as well. So it gives me a great privilege and honor that I was selected uh, to be able to do these uh, pieces because um, uh, it's, just, it's just something I've always wanted to do. I, I've always, uh, when I went to college and I kind of moved away for a little while to start my career, uh, I was always lacking something and I always knew it was being here because I was so in depth uh, with our culture during high school, that leaving during college really hurt me. Uh, so now that I'm back here full time, I'm loving and living every single day here. Uh, so without further ado, I do want to warm us up here. So I'm going to sing a song for you to give a little bit of uh, culture your way. Um, what I want to do is sing our veteran song uh, that we play. Uh, this song, um, obviously Friday was a big day for the United States with Veterans Day. So I want to extend uh, that Veterans Day into one of our songs for you. So like I said, this is our veteran song. I'm going to play two push-ups or what we consider uh, two uh, verses.
So thank you for listening. Uh, so we are all fairly local, I'm assuming here. So some of us may have visited um, our powwow events or green corn festivals in the area. Just for some examples, that is the Mohegan uh, Wigwam in August, the uh, Mashantucket Pequot Skimitsin in August, uh, Eastern Pequot in July, uh, Mashpee Wampanoag in Massachusetts and Narragansett in Rhode Island. Those are all the local uh, tribes that host these events on a yearly basis. So you may have been a little bit familiar with some of that style of music. So I want to get in a little bit deeper tonight with you uh, for a little bit more older times between the 16 and 1800s. And we'll go a little bit even before that as well. Um, but I did see Sharon. Hello. She said hi to me. Uh, Sharon Maynard is a tribal elder uh, who has taught me many of my teachings through my life. So I really appreciate her checking on in. Welcome, Sharon. We're happy to have you here. All right. So I'm going to start by teaching you our travel story, how we came to Connecticut, because we haven't always been here. Now, stay with me here, because over the hundreds of years, uh, we have lost bits and pieces, so we don't know exactly every fine detail like Europeans know about, you know, going all the way back to uh, Rome and BC. Um, also, during the 1800s, uh, we, we lost a lot of pieces because we weren't able to practice our culture. We weren't able to teach the, uh, our youth or the next generation, uh, or we weren't able to practice anything. So we lost some pieces there as well, just through that not teaching that knowledge. Um, and also, uh, we didn't have a written language. We didn't have an alphabet um, in the 1600s and before. Uh, the first person who I'll talk about later who wrote our alphabet was Samson Ockham. He wasn't born until 1723. Um, so he's the first person to really write our language down. So without all that language, we don't have diaries. We don't have written accounts of what happened. So it's all storytelling. Um, so we do the best that we can with the dates and the pieces that we have, um, but I will try to fill in the details as we go. So long ago, we estimate somewhere around the year 1000, could be earlier as well. We lived as the Lene Lenape tribe in Delaware in the New Jersey area. So that kind of um, border right there in that big cove right outside of New Jersey. That's where the Lene Lenape tribe lived. The Lene Lenape translates to first person or real person. Uh, so we do believe that is one of the, the more ancient tribes that were from this area that maybe other tribes have branched off from as well. So we were part of them. We were uh, the Mohegan people as today. We fell under the wolf clan of the Len Lene Lenape. There were two other clans there, the turkeys and the turtles. So we as the wolf people, we decided to kind of create our own identity. We wanted to branch off and become our own people. So we moved to what, uh, what is now known as Upper State New York, up by the Great Lakes. Um, we wanted to move. We wanted to be our own tribe. We moved up there by uh, the Mohawk and other several tribes as well. Several hundred years later, we believe uh, as, as early as even 1200 um, a, uh, AD uh, that we, we heard about these great uh, fishing grounds, hunting grounds, clamming, all these pristine food sources. Uh, we heard about that out east. Um, and so again, the Mohegan people, the wolf people, we picked up, moved, and uh, came all the way to Stony, what is now called Stonington, Connecticut. Um, and from there, when we came in, there was already some tribes in the area. And so what happened was we kind of forced our way in to where what is uh, where the Mashantucket Pequot Nation is today. Um, and we 
uh, kind of move other tribes, the Narragansetts and the Mashpees, a little bit more to the east um, where they are today. And so that's why we were called Pequots. We were called Pequots because Pequot translated uh, means invaders. So it wasn't uh, like a war or a bloody conflict at all. It was somewhat amicable, but however, we did kind of move into this land. Um, and so there's several uh, uh, generations go by because we do have proof that Uncas's great grandfather did live in this area of Connecticut. Uh, so that's at least um, we'd assume 1400s era. Um, but at that point, uh, you know, it's no longer just traders in the US. It's no longer just uh, the Vikings or just the Dutch. It's, it's everyone's kind of coming in now and they're staying. Uh, it's a little bit more permanent. They're not just coming in for a week and then leaving to go spend their money elsewhere. So because of that, the, uh, the Pequot people have, have kind of have these talks and our chief at the time, Sassicus, says that we need to defend ourselves. We need to protect our land and just push all these uh, Europeans out of here. We wanna hold this land for ourselves. And what happens is a man named Uncas steps in and he says, I don't believe that's the correct way uh, to, do, to go about things. Um, it's, it's told uh, through several families that before this conflict, Uncas had a dream about the Mohegan or the Pequot people uh, falling apart completely, that the entire uh, group of people is just wiped out. Um, and so Uncas relays that dream to Chief Sassicus that we need to be friends with the Europeans. We need to help them. We need to live as a community with them. Um, and Sassicus disagrees. So what happens is Uncas uh, takes his loyal followers and leaves the Pequot people and goes across the Thames River and lands in what is now known as Fort Shantock or Uncasville as the new uh, town. So in 1623, uh, he Uncas creates the Mohegan people again. Uh, he, he takes on that wolf people name uh, in Mohegan wolf is Mohegan. Um, so he adorns that ancient name yet again and creates the Mohegan people on the Western bank of the Thames River. So that is how we came here today. Fast forward about 400 years as of next year. Um, and we are still here on Mohegan Hill uh, living um, uh, helping our community members, you know, offering eight to 10,000 jobs in the local area, giving back tax, um, tax money to these states and to areas that are, are in need of it. Um, and so we are still here to this day and we are very friendly and I love performing for those in my community. So going back in time a little bit more back to the older times, I want to talk a little bit about Sansom, Samson Ockham. He is one of our most well-rounded, if that's a good term to use, I don't think so, um, or may not be, uh, but he's one of our most influential citizens in the 1700s. So a little bit about Samson Ockham. He was born in 1723 by Joshua and Sarah Ockham, his parents. Uh, he was born traditionally in a wigwam. So this is kind of getting towards the end of a traditional lifestyle. By the 1800s, if not all, but like maybe at least 95% of tribal members are living in still somewhat of a traditional house, but it is more geared towards the European house uh, build style. It's no longer wigwams and longhouses at that point in the 1800s. So he was one of the last generations to really be growing up with these uh, traditional lifestyle or traditional living. Um, he, con he converted to Christianity at the age of 17. So that would be 1740. Um, again, just a little time before the Revolutionary War. So this is still during um, Britain's rule. Uh, at the time in 1720, there was about 350 Mohegans on Mohegan Hill. Uh, mainly due to that was obviously uh, sicknesses and illnesses and plagues uh, in the late 1600s. Uh, and then also uh, it was just the, the nation was kind of going into a poverty state. There wasn't a lot of money coming in. Uh, so we had to, Mohegan men really had to join the whaling ships, the fishing ships, go off into Scandinavia. And then uh, wherever they ended up, they'd end up uh, wherever the ship ended. So that's how they made their living. So a lot of men had to leave to go and do that. So like I said, in the seven, right when he's born, there's about 350 of us Mohegans left on this hill. 
he becomes an ordained minister in 1759. And so this is kind of where his whole uh, life really takes off. So in his younger days, he was learning and being educated in the town of Lebanon, Lebanon, Connecticut. Uh, his teacher is Minister Eliezer Wheelock. Eliezer Wheelock is kind of uh, the minister in the area. He wants to pass on the word of, of God and um, really try to teach Native American boys to be Christian. He wants to, he kind of wants to create his little puppets, um, not puppets in a bad way, but he wants to, he wants to show that to his, you know, the, the Christian church that he can, what, uh, what he can do and turn these people into Christians and not savages anymore, because that's the term they gave us. Um, so Eliza Wheelock uh, taught and um, mentored uh, Occam as he grew up. He learned Hebrew, uh, Samson Occam learned Hebrew, Latin, Greek, uh, and obviously spoke English, spoke the Mohegan language. So that's at the age of like 25, he was already fluent in five languages. Um, so that the teachings really paid off. And so Eliza Wheelock really saw this and he had a very good plan um, that because he saw such success. So he said, I did so well with Samson Occam, getting him to be a minister, getting him to learn that we need to build a Christian school for Native American boys. So what happens is, he wants to send, Eliza, uh, Eliza Wheelock wants to send Samson Occam to England to raise money to build this school, this Native American boys school to become Christians and to become ministers. So what happens, what happens is Samson Occam goes to England and raises, let's see if I have the amount of money here. Yes. Nope, oh, that's not it. I don't have it here. That's sad. Um, oh, here it is. He raises 12,000 pounds. And now this is the time of 1768. So he raises 12,000 pounds. No one in that time period had that much money like on hand. It was either in, in banks or in, in whatever it would have been in. So uh, today's wealth, that would have been $2.4 million. So he raises all this money sends it back to the United States to Eliza Wheelock to start building the school. And uh, Samson Occam is so proud that he raised all this money. He's excited to go back and see what his funds and all of his hard work has done. However, he comes back and he realizes, uh, well, first of all, before he left, uh, Eliza Wheelock promised to protect his family, feed his family, um, work, uh, have his family work for him so they can get paid and, and all that good stuff. So when Samson Occam comes back, he realizes his family wasn't taken care of. They were on the border of starving. Uh, they hadn't, they weren't being paid for the last two years he was gone. Um, so Samson Occam gets really upset. He finds out that Eliza Wheelock actually built a school in New Hampshire. He actually built Dartmouth College, which was no longer a Native American boys school. It was a regular European school. So Samson Occam really felt betrayed by Eliza Wheelock's kind of double cross after all the time he spent doing what he thought was right because his teacher told him to do that. Um, so he really felt uh, that he was double crossed and he kind of wanted to get away from it. Um, it says here that he he was since he was a minister, they, they took drinking rules very seriously. So he was completely sober for almost 30 years. And then in 1770, it says that he had his first drink after all this had happened. Um, and he felt so bad after it. Again, let alone it's only one drink. But he felt so like broke about it that he wrote a full confession to the Presbyterian Church in the area. Um, and obviously they didn't do much about it because um, it wasn't really that big a deal, but he, that's how like high he was in his ministry, in his faith. Uh, so that's kind of most of his early on story as a young minister. Um, as he gets older, he gets into some more details as well. There's a big piece of his um, Samson Occam papers that we just got in this last year. Uh, one piece is about the Sermon of Moses Paul. 
Moses Paul was a convicted, let me see, here we go. So in 1771, after separating from Wheelock, he became an advocate for Indian rights. So now he's, his, he's kind of moving his focus from Christian faith into helping his fellow Native Americans. He gave a sermon for the uh, execution of Moses Paul. So what is happening is this, this uh, criminal, this Native American criminal, is on stand for killing a Europe European American man named Moses Cook in a drunken rage. Um, and he had requested Samson Ockham uh, to deliver his uh, sermon. And he wanted, uh, he wanted Samson to say that his... Um, that his conviction wasn't correct. It was too high. He should be either let go or have a, a lesser punishment. And Sansom Occam says, yes, I agree. I will do all of that. However, um, he, uh, during his sermon, he said that the case was prejudiced against the Wampanoag Indian. However, Paul's fate was to the sin of drunkenness, not to his actual crime. So Sansom Occam defended the man because of the murder but he said because he was drunk that was his sin of drunkenness and went through with the sentence so right after he defended him he said but because you were drunk you are being punished for your crimes um and so the sentence was passed out and moses paul was executed um so this was a native american a narragansett a wampanoag man uh who attacked a european man and he was sentenced to death because of it um, so that was, again, that's him living his religious rule. Uh, he took religion very seriously. Um, he wanted to follow the rule that his teacher taught him. So that was another story. Um, the last story of Samson Occam's real importance, besides obviously being the first person to have records of writing our language down and creating our alphabet, um, that was obviously a big impact for us. Uh, but his last story is the creation of Brotherton in Wisconsin. So towards the end of his life in the 17, in the late 1770s, he's, Samson Occam is unhappy with what's going on in the community. Um, uh, the, there's no money coming in. Everyone's poor. Uh, they're slow. The Mohegan tribe's slowly losing land. Um, there's some deals between some chiefs. There's some deals between the U.S. government and just wanting to take more land. Um, or right before the U.S. government, so it's like during the kind of right before the civil, uh, the Revolutionary War uh, starts. Um, so he's seeing that the 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 life he's always lived is deteriorating. So he wants to take and create a Christian but traditional lifestyle in Wisconsin called Brotherton. So he goes around to the local tribes, the Wampanoag, Narragansetts, Mashantuckets, uh, the Pequots, and he wants to take any of his loyal followers and create. A, uh, a native but Christian lifestyle. So what happens is he takes a bunch of people from each tribe that are willing to go with him and he heads them north up to on their way to Wisconsin where they later end up. Now they are in the middle of the revolution so they get stuck in New York for a while, they get stuck in another uh, town for a while during the war because there's a lot of fighting everywhere. Um, so it does take him almost a full decade to get to where they ended up in Wisconsin. Uh, he was there for about two or three years before his, uh, his death um, in 1792. So he gets there at about 1787, 1788, where they finally end up in their final resting place. And just four years later, he passes away um, at the age of 68, I believe. 68, that's good math. Um, so that was kind of like his last piece. He, he created... Uh, he was kind of screwed over by Eliza Wheelock, um, creating what he envisioned as a great thing for the Native people. Uh, so he finally left his mark on creating a Native but religious uh, group of people so that the, hopefully they could, you know, uh, have more money coming in. They could be seen in a better eye from the local, the local people. Um, so that's uh, the majority of Samson Occam's legacy in life. Now, obviously... I just hit a couple topics on that. Uh, I probably could go on for more and more, but I have not gone over the Samson Occam papers yet. 
uh, because they are very delicate and I'd have to wear gloves and use it in a specific area. So that is very difficult to do at the time. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give you a little push into what he was like. So now I'm going to share my screen in just a second. Actually, I'll do it right now. If I can figure out how to do it. Bear with me here. All right, looks like we're good to go. I'm gonna bring you on over to a little slideshow that I kind of wanna just show you some pictures of because it will help you kind of understand and see some images. I'm gonna go a little out of order, so just stick with me here. Uh, we're gonna go to some of the older people right here. All right, so we have four very important people here. I already talked about the, the person in the bottom right. That is a depiction of Samson Occam. I'm not sure if that's an actual uh, painting of him or if it's a depiction. Uh, I have not learned that much uh, about his um, correctiveness of pictures or portraits, uh, but that is what we believe he looked like um, in all of his pictures. And that is Mohegan Church in the background on the left. If you go right above him, I know this really isn't ancient history, uh, but the picture on the top right is of Gladys Tantequidgen uh, standing right next to her regalia. Uh, if you look at her regalia, you'll see a medicine belt uh, or a belt around the waist. And I will get to that in a very quick second because that is a very important piece for us. Now, a little background about Gladys Tantequidgen. She was born in 1899 and she lived until 2005. I can actually remember coming to the museum as a kid, as like a six-year-old in 2001, and seeing Gladys come down the steps of her house and coming to see the museum or talk to us. That was a great privilege to be able to see and even speak to her. Um, she was a three-century woman um, living all the way to the age of 106. So it was, a, it was a great honor to be able to even see her. She was a medicine woman. I believe she was uh, deemed our medicine woman in the 60s. I could be wrong. Um, I don't know the exact date, uh, but we always held her as our one of our medicine women uh, of the 1900s. Uh, so what happens is her and her brother Harold and her father John Tantequidgen, um, during the Great Depression of the 1920s, right after World War I, decide, well, life's not going great, but we need to do something for our tribe. So she, along with her brother and dad, create the Mohegan Museum right here, or the Tantequidgen Museum, right on Mohegan Hill. The museum was built in 1931, um, and she was 32 years old at the time when it was finished. And so ever since then, it's been owned and operated by the Mohegan people, uh, which is a great honor for us and all my coworkers, because not many places you can go to teach about your own identity and your own culture. So that's a great privilege for us. So she was our second most previous medicine woman. Uh, you may have heard of Melissa Tandequidgen Zobel. Uh, she was our previous medicine woman who just stepped down from the position uh, this summer. Um, sad to see her go, but she is still part of our tribe today. Um, and she does still help out with teachings and ceremonies. She just um, needed to step away from that position. So going back farther in time now, the picture in the very middle, that is an image of Emma Baker. Emma Baker was born in the, I want to say the, the early 1800s. Um, and she is also, we poth posthumously, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, awarded her as one of our medicine women of the 1800s. Uh, like I said earlier, we couldn't have ceremonial titles. We couldn't teach anything. We couldn't practice culture or anything. So we don't really have those records during that 150 year span. So we named her this because of all everything she did for us. Um, our, she was a big proponent building our Mohegan church in 1831. Uh, so from then she worked harder and harder to help protect our culture and to enrich ourselves during these tough times. Uh, so she's a big proponent of getting our wigwam festival back up and running. Um, where we get to share our culture with our surrounding community members, uh, sell food, sell crafts, uh, make things for people. So that's a great way for us to raise money 
to send men to uh, Washington, D.C. to fight for our rights in the 1800s. Uh, she also creates the Women's Sewing Society out of the Mohegan Church. Um, they, what their job was to make quilts. However, that was kind of like a, a front job. Uh, while they were making these quilts and meeting, they'd be talking about culture, talking about events coming up. They'd be putting money into a hat to raise money for events that they're doing. Uh, they'd be teaching culture. They'd be trying to teach what little language they had left. Um, and so it wasn't just quilting. Uh, it, was, it was more than that. It's where we get all of our stories today. Most of what she had taught down to, to those who were listening at the time are the same stories that I am telling you today. So because of her and several other brave men and women, I get to teach all of you a little bit about our culture. Now, the last person on this slide is my three, four times great grandmother, Fidelia Fielding. Uh, her mom is a life at Fielding. So she would be my five times great, great grandmother. And she was born, I believe, a life was born in the early 1700s, around the same time as Samson Occam. Uh, but about Fidelia Fielding, she's one of, uh, one of the biggest uh, females in our tribe as well, because she was our last fluent speaker of the Mohegan language. Um, uh, she passed away in the early 1800s. I'm sorry, I don't have exact dates. Um, I have a lot of information all over the place, and I need to get a little bit better on having them all in the same spot. I may be able to actually help you with dates in just a second. Um, but so she's our last fluent speaker. She is, uh, she had a diary as well. She, her, her uh, native name was called uh, Flying Bird, I believe. Uh, and so she had uh, her diary that we now have. Um, so we have her accounts of stories. We have her written accounts of ceremony, medicine, um, everything that happened during her time. So because of that, that also helped really have us fill a lot of holes in that we were kind of missing just from telling stories from generation to generation. So she's a very important person for us. Um, like I said, she's born in the early 1800s. Um, so that pretty much ties in with that kind of old style era before we turn into a more modern society. All right, let me see here if I got anything else. Ancient, 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 ancient. We'll go, let's see here. We'll probably move away from um, the ancient times unless we have questions. Uh, again, I will save plenty of time for questions that we'll get to in a second. I will just continue with a couple updated pieces of important people today. So, uh, on the right hand side, you may know her, you may have seen her. Uh, she's the new treasury of the United States. That is Lynn Malerba. Uh, her tribal name is Many Hearts because she was a nurse and a doctor um, in her previous life before she was our chief. Um, again, she, she grew up learning from some of, of her grandmothers and grandfathers uh, that about the culture, about the way of life, about ceremony. So she was a, a perfect pick for our next chief when our uh, previous chief, Ralph Sturgis, passed away in 2005, 2007, sorry, 2007. Uh, she's our current chief. Uh, she's the first female chief in over 300 years. So that is a big groundbreaking achievement as well. She's done a fantastic job, as you can tell. She's, I mean, when the president of the United States acknowledges it, that's pretty awesome to us. Now the two images on the left are very important people to me as well. On the top left, we have Lemuel Fielding, my three times great grandfather, son to uh, Fidelia Fielding. Uh, so he is in my direct uh, lineage of family members. He was chief or named chief between the years 1903 and 1928. Um, and I think it's really cool because Growing up, seeing pictures of my grandfather, my grandfather looks just like him. And it's very eerie, it's very eerie on how sim similar they look. Um, and when you keep going down the lines of men in my family, they all look pretty similar. And then you get to me and I look nothing like any, any of them. So it's very strange. Um, but that is Lemuel Fielding. He's one of our great chiefs of the 1900s. 
Uh, below him is his son, Everett Fielding, who served after him from 1927 to 1935. Uh, so he's my two times great grandfather, three times. I can't remember. It's too many times grandfathers. Um, but he served from 1927 to 1935. Uh, he stepped down from it um, because Lemuel's uh, brother um, was ready to take over uh, his chiefdom. That is Chief Mataga. All right, going over to a couple more influential people. We'll go right here. So this is a, just some of our ceremonial current positions. Uh, on the bottom right, we have our current elder chairman, um, Charlie Two Bears Strickland. Uh, so he is a big influential person to me because he's always been my drum teacher. He's been teaching me a lot of culture about that, not only about drumming, but about everything else. Uh, he's a very wise elder in our tribe who, who does his best to help anyone and everyone who goes to him. He's also our lo uh, one of our lodge keepers. Our, uh, he's a drum keeper. Um, he, he can perform almost any type of ceremony. So he is very versatile in his teachings, which is awesome. On the top right, we have Chris Harris. He is one of our pipe carriers. So that is uh, like a smoking pipe. He can perform any ceremony um, like that. Uh, I do not know much about the pipe ceremony. I've only seen a couple in my lifetime, um, but it's very good to have these positions filled and that these teachings aren't going away. The two men on the left, we have Jay Iloff on the left side and we have Tommy Hatchet on the right or throws his hatchet, I should say. That's his uh, tribal name. Those two are fire keepers. So they have the very difficult but blessed job on to run our sacred fires and to keep our sacred fires lit. So anytime we have a ceremony or an event, it's, it's either one of them or both of them's job to keep that fire lit and light that fire with good medicine and good um, mental space. Um, the, the other big item for this is a funeral fire. So it's not just a simple fire that you can have at any moment. Um, it's a four day long fire, a, I don't know how many hours that is, uh, 144 hours maybe, it could be wrong. Um, no, that's way wrong, 100 and something. So it's four days straight of having that fire lit, feeding that fire, keeping it small. It's not supposed to be a big fire. Um, you know, you sleep when you can, you set alarm clocks when you can to, to feed the fire again. Yes, they do get some help, um, but their job is to have that fire going for four days. The reason that we have a four-day funeral fire is so that when the per, uh, when uh, the Mohegan passes away, their spirit only has so much time to find the fire and to carry the smoke up to the land of our ancestors. So we have to have that fire down. If it's only down for a day, that spirit might not find that sacred fire to be carried up to the ancestors. So they really need that four days so that spirit can find their way back home. Um, so that's a very uh, in-depth and ceremonial position for us. Sorry I'm, if I'm giving anyone uh, some eyesores from moving too quick. All right, the last piece of our traditional side here, um, I just wanna show you kind of like our living styles, of, our traditional living styles before the 1700s. So starting out on the right, in the upper right, those are two of our wigwams here at our uh, Tanaquijan Museum. Uh, this is in our replica village. As you can see, we have our, uh, our wooden fence around the side. We have some outdoor uh, fire circles as well. Um, but these are just replica, uh, you know, handmade. Uh, we did it all traditional to put them up um, and to create them. Uh, but it kind of just shows you what we lived in. Now, these wigwams are one to two family style uh, dwellings. Uh, we use the poplar bark from the poplar tree to use as our siding. So that's kind of what you see. Let me see if I can get my cursor on these right here. Similar to the long house on the upper left. You kind of have that shingling type uh, wooden wall. So you might be asking, well, how'd you get it flat? Well, we have a very easy uh, answer for that. We'd put heavy logs. We'd lay the pieces of bark down. We put heavy logs down to over time flatten those uh, the bark. So once that bark was seasoned and flattened, we'd then be able to attach it to the sides of our wigwams. 
Now the poles going around the outside and around the inside are our cedar poles. They go deep into the ground to withstand storms, withstand uh, any other type of uh, weather we get. Now, some of you may have uh, remembered the snowstorms and hurricanes of uh, I think 2013, 2012. I remember it was my senior year of high school, but I don't remember what year it was, uh, where we lost power in this area for like two weeks. These were still standing. These wigwams here were still standing after those storms. So they are very good in protecting ourselves during severe weather like we had up here. Um, to the left, we have a longhouse. And to the bottom left, we have what's look, uh, what the inside of a longhouse may look like. So these weren't uh, as traditional in our area or in our um, village as much. We would use them uh, time and time again, but not as much as other tribes in the Northeast would have. So basically, instead of having a wigwam for every family, there was one longhouse or, or a couple longhouses to store either multiple families or supplies. As you can see here, this wigwam is probably about 15 feet high, uh, very small in diameter. Uh, so you can only fit maybe four to five people living in there. However, in one of these longhouses, they could be up to a football field in length, uh, two stories high. So you can make even second floors in some areas. It was kind of like our version of a, uh, of a condominium with all those different apartments everywhere. That was kind of our idea there. Um, but as you can see, there's living arrangements, there's storage, there's hearths every, every 15, 20 feet to keep the space warm. Now, not only would these be living arrangements, they'd be uh, ceremony holders. They'd be like a great hall. Uh, so you can have meetings, you can have ceremony, whatever else you need. Um, uh, you can have harvest festivals, any kind of dinner would be used in these uh, giant longhouses. Now, our last structure, um, which you may have also seen or you kind of may use somewhat today, is our, of course, I always blank the name of this. It's our old time sauna, which is what we call our sweat lodge. I, for some reason, I can never remember that name. Um, so these are what our sweat lodges look like. It's kind of like a, uh, a sauna that you might go to today and let the steam um, get really hot in the room. Uh, so ours was a little bit more traditional, but it kind of runs the same way. We'd have our small little poles about almost head height when you're sitting. And then you'd put some either like a tarp over it or deer skins or bear skins or anything thick to keep the warm in. What happens is before the sweat starts, we we'd light a fire outside and put uh, stones in there. Over time, those stones would heat up. And when it's time for the sweat, we'd take a couple stones in, put them in the sand pit in the very middle, and we'd pour water on it to create steam and heat. So it, it cleans, cleanses the body of bad spirits. It cleanses the mind of bad thoughts. Um, and we do what we do is we do multiple rounds of this. So we'd go in and out of the sweat lodge without talking, without conversing with each other. It's just you and praying to your creator, to your ancestors. Um, so as the rounds go on, more and more rocks are placed, more and more water are poured on the rocks. So the temperature goes higher and higher throughout the, throughout the event. Now, as the temperature rises, obviously your body is, is fighting more and more because it's getting hotter and hotter. So it's not only, you know, a mental aspect between having to pray between you and the ones you're praying to, but also your, your body is getting physically, you know, almost hurt in a way. Obviously we all come out perfectly fine, but it's very hard to sit in that hot area, you know, getting up to even like 120, 130 degrees, even hotter in some cases. Um, it's, you know, it's very, it can be very hard for people. Um, I know I've had my challenges as a kid where I last like six minutes. Um, as a kid, my face would get too hot and I'd have to leave uh, because I didn't know any better. Um, but then my, my father, my grandfather and other uh, men who'd go into the sweat lodge would come out hours later and be, um, you know, be cleansed of all those bad spirits. Uh, so I want to apologize that that's all I really have time for today. I wish I could go on for hours and hours, and I have hundreds of pieces I could show you. I have dozens of songs I can play for you. If it wasn't over Zoom, I would uh, dance an Eastern war dance for you, but that just means you have to come on over to a powwow at some point and watch it for yourself. 
Uh, but what I want to do now is I want to personally, first of all, thank you for coming and joining. Um, like I said, I do love teaching my culture and my history. Uh, there's thousands of topics I can go over. I could bore you all to death. Um, but I really wanted to cover a little bit more of the older versions and then also the traditional and ceremonial aspects tonight. So I'd like to open up to some questions because we do have about 15 minutes left. Um, if Carla, you want to moderate and ask the questions or I can just look through the chat myself. I can do that as well, whatever you want to do. Um, sure. But I want to make sure I answer some questions. Yeah, thank you so much, David. That flew by. Um, mm. that's um, so the first question we have in our chat is, can you talk about the Mohegan mythology and ancient religion? That's a whole other um, webinar probably worth. It could be, but I'll, I'll try to give a short question. Uh, mythology is tough. Uh, I can give you our creation story. So our creation story is, is more of a children's story, uh, but there is some obvious um, belief in it to adults as well. So long ago, when the world, when the earth was just water, uh, Grandfather Turtle slept at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, what happened is he, he woke up and he, he, he uh, floated to the top of the ocean. And with all the gunk and mud and dirt from the bottom was stuck to his back. And so when he arose, um, he looked like an island. He looked like a piece of land. Over time, trees started to grow. Uh, rivers and, and, and other things flowed through it. Um, and animals came, uh, popped out of the ground and humans started to form as well. Uh, and everything formed on the back of Grandfather Turtle. And so we, we take a lot of teachings from Grandfather Turtle. I didn't get into any of them today, uh, but we do have a lot of teachings that we take from the turtle. Um, like our calendar, for example, is just one, which I can get into later. Um, but we, that's how we believe that our, our world was, was made because at, at the time we didn't, we just thought we were the only ones here. We thought that North South America was turtle Island. That's what we call it. When you go to California, um, they natives usually refer to our land as, um, as turtle Island. Uh, so that's kind of like our mythology of how we were, how our land was created. Um, but we don't really have mythology as in like, uh, Thor and Odin, um, a little bit different, but that's kind of what we have. Great, thank you. And then um, another question is, does the Roger Williams book, A Key into the Language of America, have any credibility as far as the Mohegan language? What book is it called? Because I don't, I don't even know. Uh, a Key into the Language of America, and it, maybe by Roger Williams? I'm not familiar. Um, so I don't know what book you're referring to. I, I have not read that, um, but I can say I have read other books um, generalizing what it was like before Europeans came here as you know the first people kind of started trading here. They weren't living here, but they were trading. Um, there's one book I'm reading right now, which mentions the Mohegan people uh, several times. They kind of pair the language into the Algonquin uh, larger group. Um, so we kind of, in a way, language is kind of similar to our accents here in the U.S. In the Northeast, we call the Algonquin, but it's kind of similar to, you speak a little bit different, like the Algonquin language is like, you know, you speak like you are in Texas, you have the Boston accent, you have the Louisiana accent. So those Algonquin languages, you can kind of understand each other, but they're a little bit different. Words are different. They might speak a little bit different, but um, so I'd have to read the book and get back to you on that. Yes, we're all learning all the time. Um, let's see. The next question was, with the anniversary of the American Revolution approaching, can you recommend any resources for learning more about the tribe's experience and participation? Is the anniversary coming up? Is is there a, what, the end date or the start date? I let's see, it's going to be twenty twenty three. It's been a long time since I took a history class. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, I, I can go. I can go into it. Yeah. Um, so even before the United States became a nation, right? Uh, when it was just natives here, we we have fought in every war that has been fought on this land. 
um, when it was with just the British, you know, we had uh, the English Pequot War. Uh, so that was the Pequot War when we, when us, the Narragansetts and the Mash Pequot, uh, the Wampanoag Nation teamed together with the English to fight the Pequots and the Dutch. Uh, you know, we fought, um, we then had a war against the Narragansetts where the English uh, wanted to fight the Narragansetts. So we did a lot of fighting there. When the world became a nation, Revolutionary War, Mohegans were fighting in that war. Uh, we, we took great pride in, we fought with, the, uh, with kind of both sides at, at certain points. Uh, we kind of started off with the English. Um, obviously, we've been friends with them for the past hundred years. Uh, so we did kind of start off with them at the very beginning. But to my knowledge, we quickly changed into favor of the Confederate, uh, not the Confederacy, that's the Civil War. Um, the begins with a C. Continental, that's the word I was looking for. We sided with the Continental Army uh, pretty quickly into the war. Um, because at that point, again, we kind of wanted to break free from English rule. We kind of wanted to have our way of life back. So that kind of gave us a purpose. Little did we know that it was going to be worse once the U.S. won or once the Continental won. Um, so since then, we fought in every war, uh, Civil War, um, Vietnam. Uh, we have, have, have had uh, written accounts of people fighting in every war um, on this land and also uh, in the, the recent last hundred years of wars as well. Um, and still fighting to this day. We have veterans. My grandfather uh, fought in the Vietnam War as a sailor. Um, my uncle fought in uh, the Vietnam War as well as a, as a sailor. So um, there's many accounts of us fighting in all those um, affairs, so. And thank you for your service to everyone. Um, I've heard, this is another question. I've heard that Samson Occam and another person were educated, whoops, it's jumping around here, were educated by Niantic Community Church who paid for the education. Supposedly these papers documenting this are in the East Lime Library. Are you familiar with this and is it? I am not. I've only been in this position for a couple months now since August. Uh, so I really haven't, you know, made my um, relationships with the, with the local libraries, with our own community of what we have. We alone have so many papers and so many, we have a whole house. The Tanaquitian house is filled with accounts, papers, news clippings. So it's very hard to, to go one by one and read all those. Um, that everyone donated to the tribe, like all of our tribal families donated for federal recognition. Um, so that's something, again, I'd have to read up on. Uh, but you're saying that the, the, the place paid for education for what? So it looks like Samson Occam edu was educated by Niantic Community Church. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the Lebanon in Niantic, he kind of learned in both places. Um, he started his teachings in Lebanon and then he moved to Niantic uh, as like an older teen to keep kind of learning from uh, more and more missionary type people. So yes, that's correct. Great. Um, there was another question about regalia. Um, mm. I can answer that. Okay. I would like to learn more about the various dances and different regalia used. Do you know of any resources I can use? Um, if you have a pen and paper down, I'd suggest taking a couple notes and looking them up on YouTube. I can type um, them in the chat too. That too, that too. I am not a good typer, um, so Go I won't be doing that. Um, but one, the styles of dance. If you're ever looking on YouTube and you wanna learn a bit more, uh, in our area, we dance to what we call Eastern War, um, fancy dancing, grass dancing, and then Northern and Southern traditional. And that's all for men. So those are just men dances. Now, com coming with those four styles, there are many different second songs or, or special songs, as we call them, that go with each kind of special dance, which you would probably find in your search as well. For women, they have uh, Eastern Blanket, which is traditional to our area. There is Fancy Shawl. There is Jingle. 
And then there's also Northern and Southern traditional as well. So those four, because Northern and Southern are pretty similar. There's just a little bit different, um, different kind of style. Um, so there's kind of those eight total dances that we portray in our local powwows or wigwam festivals. Um, and then also they asked about regalia or was that just music or is that just dancing? I think it was dancing and regalia. Yeah. Uh, so regalia is a little bit different. Uh, that's really depends on your style and your dance style. So jingle dress dancers have to wear the jingle dress. Um, now they can design that as uh, whatever, however they want, but they have to have those jingles on their, in their dress. They have to have specific um, headdresses or um, I don't know the proper term that women call them. Um, hair clips, uh, bands on their forehead to hold uh, their, their eagle feathers or whatnot. Um, but when it goes to men, it's the same thing. So I dance Eastern War, so I wear Eastern War regalia. One piece that I love to show is my bear claw necklace right here. So I have all my bear claws um, that kind of show I'm a warrior. It shows that I can take down a bear, even though we all know I can't. Um, so this is like an intimidation tactic to when I dance, I'm telling the other dancers like, uh, or traditionally I'm telling the other warriors that we're fighting against that I'm gonna beat you because if I can take down a bear, I can take down you. Um, and so that's just one of my pieces that I can wear. I have many others, uh, but Eastern War is very old style. So it's still wearing traditional deer skin. It's wearing uh, buckskin, elk, animal products as um, I kind of just overall refer to them. Uh, the other styles like fancy shawl, jingle, uh, northern and southern straight for the men, they have more cloth, more metal. Uh, so they're able to have that more modern um, look to them while we're a little bit more old school because that's what Eastern War is about. Now, every dance has their own story. I could go on for a while and talk about the story, but I will tell you that the Eastern War dance is a story about um, portraying what you did in battle or what you did in the hunt. So a lot of times when you see, you know, the warriors dancing are showing that they were fighting someone, that they were defending someone. They might be shooting their, their bow and arrow. They might be shooting a rifle, uh, whatever that may be. So they portray that um, in their dance. And there's no set steps, it's not like a tango and there's, you know, specific steps and routines. You kind of have like your list of dance moves you like to do. And you'll do that whenever you want. Every song you, every song you dance to could be different. Um, and then same thing with the Eastern blanket dance for women. Uh, it's a, it's a song about maturity and growing up and having more responsibility. Um, so when you first start, uh, I have, I had a picture over there earlier, you kind of hold your blanket up over your face to protect yourself. You're shy, you're young. Um, and then as the song and dance goes on, you kind of uncover your face and you start dancing with your blanket around your body, which kind of shows you that you're becoming mature. You understand what the world is. You're more comfortable with yourself. Um, and so it kind of shows that you're getting into the adulthood time of your life. Um, so every story, every dance has their own story. I think we have time for one more question, don't we? Yes, we do. And also I haven't um, read these out loud, but there are many, many compliments and uh, um, requests for another program. So, um, and people saying, please keep doing these. Um, David, please do this again. So um, that's always great to hear. Um, I'd be more than happy to. Okay, great. So one other question here is, I've been hearing about Native American church called the Church of Four Directions. Do you know anything about this? And could you talk a little bit about it? I have not heard of that. Um... My best guess is that it is a traditional style church. Um, and I could be wrong here. I haven't heard about it, but we do have the four directions. Um, and, and for us now, with many Native American communities, um, whether we're in rural era, eras or city eras, areas, um, everyone kind of has their issues. You know, there's, there's drug problems, alcohol problems. So we do have a drug and alcohol like prevention plan here. We have a sober house for not only natives, but also our community members. It's open to whoever's in the area. Um, so that is a big thing for us to offer those individuals. Um, so at our sober house, we do teach our medicine wheel, our, our uh, four directions, because that all has the medicine that can hopefully 
get you away from those tough times in your life. Um, so it is a good teaching tool to use for that, um, for certain things. So it could be using that as a way of learn mixing Christianity and tradition. Um, but I would have to do more research. It could be fake. It could be real. I, I'm not sure I'd have to really look into it. Um, but that's, uh, just more reading for me. I love it. I love educating myself. Well, thank you. And I'll add, you know, that all of us in the library world are all about um, lifelong learning. So um, we're all excited that we learned a lot tonight. And um, it is after seven. So um, we will wrap it up. And we, um, you know, what they say is leave them wanting more. So um, yes, this is a this is a great start. And um, thank you so much for graciously teaching us. Thank Thanks you, for having me and I'll see you next time. Thank you very much. It was excellent. Thank you.